Very often people think it's gonna be funny and then they realize it's not really, we really do music. It's not impossible to make music with vegetables. My name is Susanna Gartmeier and then I'm a member of the Vegetable Orchestra. The orchestra exists since 18 years now. The first instrument was the tomato, because you can do sound with tomatoes, but it will be messy for sure. We go shopping on the market first. We choose all the vegetables there. We have three kinds of instruments. One is the ready-made. You can just buy it at the market and play it. It's like the pepper, it's called, no? It's ready already. And then there are the simple instruments, like with one cut or some cuts. You get it like that. Then with the more complex instruments, we have some that work like normal instruments, you know. The pumpkin is uh, the bass drum and the sound of the pumpkin is really important. Good. After shopping, we go to the venue and start to build instruments. All in all, it takes two to three hours to build all the instruments for everybody. And then we start with the sound check. And since we have new instruments each time, we have to have a very long sound check. We have a lot of different musical influences in the orchestra. Since we're really many people, everybody's interested in different things. We make a soup during the building process of the vegetable instruments with the remaining uh, vegetables and we serve it to the audience after the concert. And it's also after hearing and seeing us and smelling the vegetables, which will be intense in there because it's so small, this theater, and then you can also eat it. You never get it out of your head anymore if you're in the orchestra to look vegetables in another way. There's a crime. Detectives follow the clues. They get close, but then they reach the water. So they call in the underwater criminal investigator. That's Mike Barry. Hold on, this is Mike Barry. I dive in very strange places looking for very strange things. Mike has been an underwater criminal investigator for 35 years. How easy is it to get rid of a murder weapon? All it is is a flick of the wrist. In someone's mind, that murder weapon is forever gone. They have no idea there are people like me crazy enough to go down there and search. Law enforcement depends on guys like Mike to preserve and recover evidence. Your three cores in uh, underwater criminal investigation is body recovery, vehicle recovery, and evidence recovery. I get called about twice a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. And when a call comes in, Hello? chances are Mike's in for a challenge. Some of these locations are absolutely disgusting. Our typical dive site is dark, it's deep, it's cold, it's full of obstructions, it's contaminated. The danger is there when you get in the water. You know, I've had murderers tell me, you know, you'll never find it. I said, well, we'll see. Go ahead, diver one. I've located the weapon. For diver one. There's nothing like finding the target. When your hand hits it and you feel it and you realize you've got it, for a public safety diver, uh, there's no greater thing. And when he's out there searching for a body? I look at it as an honor because you realize the importance of what you're asked to do. There's a family and there's no closure until you bring them up. You know, not every diver can do this. Not everybody has it in their DNA. It's what I was meant to do. I couldn't think of anything better to do with my life. Truth is, I can't wait for the next call to help someone in some way, either to bring closure or to bring a conviction.
I cook for warthogs, emu, lions, tigers, hyenas, spoonbill, sun bear, flamingo, and giraffe. They can be very picky. Every morning, I'm preparing around 350 pounds of food. My name is Stacy Kyles, and I prepare the food for the animals at the Oakland Zoo. I'm also known as the Zoo Chef. My day starts off very early before the sun even comes up. I've got to get the food for the animals or we have nothing to prepare. The calm before the storm of getting to the market. I need to get about a ton of food today, literally. The produce market's kind of hectic. You've got a lot of forklifts running back and forth. You've got trucks everywhere. There's a lot to choose from. I have to stay organized or this can get very overwhelming. I've got a huge market that I've got to go through. I've got to pick out the right produce. So I have a limited amount of time at the market because I have to get back here to prepare the diets. I open the door to the kitchen and then I know my day has truly begun. Sun bears. 48 grams apple. Kawada Monday, three hard boiled eggs, Lions. cut in half, 10 bones, and 20 five ounces of grapes. grapes. Off the vine, seven servings, two whole bananas, 60 carrots, grams of crickets, crickets, one drop, vervet vitamin, 44 grams of banana, banana of calcium, no two root and root vegetables, 44 grams of chocolate, three ounces of lake smelt. The zoo itself, as a whole prepares about a thousand diets a day. So that's anywhere from the elephants down to the leaf cutter ants and all the little reptiles and all the little frogs. It's important that we get the diets right because the animals can't send the food back. They can't tell us, oh, I don't like this. We don't take days off. Everything still has to happen. The food gets prepared exactly the same way every single day. I tried telling them it was Christmas once, they didn't pay attention. Usually when people first see the mannequin, they're kind of wondering, you know, what does it do? I mean, what's the purpose of it? It has mouth, it has teeth, it has soft gums, it has a cheek. You can tell we got the same haircut as well. My name is Philip Rialis. I am the director of sales for Columbia Dental Farm. We supply dental mannequins to dental schools. What we basically supply is their first patient for them to train on before they actually move on to live patients. The company started in 1917. So next year, Columbia Dental Farm will be 100 years old. The models, the mannequins are all assembled by hand. We sell well over a million teeth a year. We make a variety of models. We provide models that put tartar on the teeth. We make models that have a variety of disease under the gums, on the gums. If they need to, they could do a root canal on the dog and cat as well. We have models that have absolutely no teeth at all, so they can learn how to do a complete denture. The reason why it actually looks this way, we really didn't want to put any gender in the mannequin, so it could be anybody. The design of it is based on, on, on what an average human would look like as far as the size of the head, the ears, the mouth opening, the softness of the gum tissue. The only thing it doesn't simulate is maybe the bad breath. But other than that, it's a great patient because it just cooperates with you. I've been with the company for 41 years. I have no idea that I'll be working with dental mannequins at all or all these teeth. My granddaughters think I work for the tooth fairy. And so that really works out well because if, if their parents forget to put money under the pillow for a tooth, they'll tell mom, just talk to grandpa, he knows, all, he knows the tooth fairy. A lot of people consider mini golf to be very benign and all fun and games, but at this level, it can be a cutthroat competition among the greatest players in the world. My name is Matt Mayle, I'm a professional mini golfer. 
I was a regular golfer ever since childhood. I started at about eight years old and putting was always the greatest facet of my game. The idea of doing nothing but putting for 18 holes instantly appealed to me and I just began practicing a lot. <laughs> People don't realize that mini golf is a highly precise sport. Improvement can come very tediously. To be competitive, it really requires uh, an extensive mapping of each hole and we can be out here for up to 10 hours a day or so for several days before a tournament. When I first arrive at a course, I diagnose the holes. I want to come up with a, a clear plan of attack on each hole and then just it's a matter of repetition from there. We are at the 2016 Mini Golf Masters in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. This tournament is the premier event each year in mini golf. It draws players from all over the world. The green jacket is the most coveted prize in, in mini golf. The competition is very fierce. The players here are the best of the best and it's an immense challenge because even a stretch of five bad minutes or 10 bad minutes can disqualify you from contention. Just a tiny miscue here or there can spell major disaster on one hole. I really do have an authentic admiration of what the winner had to do to, to perform uh, under the pressure of, of such a, a major tournament because um, I, I know from experience how hard it is. Mini golf's not a sport for everyone. There's constant frustration, there's constant adversity. It, it, it rewards patience and it rewards determination and it never gets old to see the ball go in the hole. I don't think that thrill will ever go away.